to look to somebody who does it really well. If you want to learn how to make three-point shots in basketball, there's someone you can watch on tape, watch on video, watch on YouTube, who in the middle of games with people in their face, yelling at them, threatening, going, running, running, you know, getting into a position shooting, has averaged 43% making three-point shots. His name is Steph Curry. You want to learn how to make a three-point shot? He'd be a good person to watch. You want to, if you're a golfer, if you want to learn how to use a pitching wedge, 64-degree wedge, dangerous to work with, 60-degree wedge, 56 some of you are going, I don't even know what a wedge is, I'm not a golfer, that's okay. But if you want to learn how to use it and get some real creativity, watch somebody like a Phil Mickelson or somebody else who's just a, a kind of a, a short game wizard. If you want to learn how to handle your finances from a Christian biblical worldview, there's lots of great things out there, but there's people like a Dave Ramsey who's taught just tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people how to manage their finances and make wise choices and be generous towards the things of the Lord. There's people that will teach you how to take a step forward in that area. If you want to learn how to be a great country singer, some of you are going, that's my life's goal. But I did a little research on this. There is a woman who has 25 gold, platinum, or multi-platinum albums. She has 25 number one songs that have hit the Billboard country charts. Over 110 singles that made it onto the charts. And watch this. Over 3,000 songs she's written over the decades. Her name is Dolly Parton. I did the math. That's like almost writing a song every week for 60 years. Right? I mean, it's, it's incredible, but, but, but there's people you can look to and say, man, if I want to learn about that, here's somebody, they're doing it. I mean, they're living it. If you want to learn to pray, really learn to pray, look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. Jesus prayed like breathing. Jesus prayed regularly, consistently, passionately, powerfully. If you want to learn to pray, look to Jesus. And one of the best places you could look is in the Gospel of John chapter 17. If you have your Bibles there, I'd encourage you to open to John 17 and just keep your Bible open there. And keep it open there for the next three weeks. Because I'm going to be walking. This is the longest prayer of Jesus in the Bible. The most well-known prayer is found in the Sermon on the Mount. We call it the Lord's Prayer. But it's very short. I actually prayed it as I opened the service today. It's very short. But John 17 is the longest, the biggest prayer of Jesus. <clears throat> and, and the rhythm of this prayer is beautiful. And this is how we're going to kind of walk through the next three weeks. Jesus begins by really giving glory to God. Glorifying God. Prayers that glorify God. That's where we're going to begin today. Then he moves into prayers for the church. For those who have put their faith in God through Jesus. He prays for you and for me. For those who put their faith in him. That's what we'll look at next week. And then he prays, listen to this, for all the people that will come to faith through those who already have faith. That's the world. Everyone who doesn't yet know Jesus. That's what we'll look at three weeks from now. But Lord, this is our prayer, that we would learn from you, Jesus, that we would open our hearts, our eyes, our lives to understand the greatness of who you are, the beauty and the glory of your majesty, and that we would become people not just that pray on occasion, but the prayer becomes so much a part of who we are that being aware of your presence and speaking with you looks like Jesus did, just as part of our life, that we have that intimacy with you that leads us to deep places of prayer. So lead us forward as prayers, we pray in your name. Amen. 
So many prayers for many of us. So many prayers are small in scope in creativity and in passion. So many of our prayers can be very small and limited prayers. I want to be very clear. They aren't necessarily bad prayers. They just aren't big prayers. They aren't faith-filled prayers. If your prayer life begins and ends with this, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. God bless Daddy and Mommy and Aunt Billy and I mean, Aunt, Aunt Susie, Uncle Billy. God, God, bless, God bless the people. My, is there anything wrong with that kind of prayer? No. If that's your only prayer, here's my suggestion. Your prayers might need to get bigger <laughs> because we worship a big God. If your prayer, if your prayer life is basically reduced to this, if this is your basic prayer life, okay, God, gimme, 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 and gimme some more. If that's your prayer life, I suggest there's more. Is there anything wrong with asking God to help you in times of need? No. Is there anything with asking for God's provision? No. But if all you ever pray, if the only time you ever pray is when you want or need something, If that's all your prayer, I want to suggest God has bigger things in mind for your prayer life. If you've memorized prayers and you repeat them without thinking, I suggest there's more to prayer. Is there anything wrong with memorizing prayers, especially memorizing biblical prayers? No. If you've you've memorized the Lord's Prayer, and many of you learned that growing up in church, that's wonderful. But you don't just say, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, the kingdom come, that will be done. Amen. I've heard people say, oh, I can do those kind of prayers without even thinking. It's like, well, that's the point. <laughs> then you're not thinking. But if, if you're praying the Lord's Prayer and you say, give us today our daily bread. God, I need enough for today, man. It's, it's going to be a tough week, a tough day, but God, provide what I need God, give me what I need in my relationships. I feel empty and depleted, but give me the bread I need, the strength I need for today. God, give me the courage I need for this situation. Give me, I'm not asking for cakes and desserts. Lord, give me the bread I need today. Oh, Lord, help me. That's prayer that God hears. That's big prayer. We're springboarding from learned prayers to bigger personal prayers. And so, if, if we've let our prayer lives kind of shrink down to something very simple, to it's, it's just kind of at the end of a meal or the beginning of a meal or at the end of the day, and it's kind of a quick boom, 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 done, check it off my list. I want to suggest in these next three weeks that God might just open your mind and your heart to realize that prayer is so much more. It is so much bigger, so much more wonderful, so much more glorious and powerful. And so I invite you to join me looking at John chapter 17. We'll look at the first five verses this morning, and we're going to just walk through Jesus' prayer. I want to read it and invite you just to let your heart be engaged with this prayer of Jesus. I mean, this is, this is Emmanuel, God with us, Jesus Christ, praying to the Father. And so John 17, beginning in verse 1. After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and he prayed. I want you to notice something as he's praying. Where are his eyes? Toward heaven. Are they closed or open? They're open. He's looking toward heaven as he prays. And this is his prayer. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you. Glory to the Father. For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life. That they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Oh, Lord, we pray today, as we think about this part of Jesus' prayer, as we think about how he lifted glory to your name, O Father, as he acknowledged that he, the Son of God, deserved glory and praise. May we be people who pray with passion in a way that brings you glory, that lifts up your name, that it gives you exaltation that you deserve. Meet us in this time and speak to our hearts in fresh ways about prayer. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, we worship a big God, and that means that every time we pray a prayer, in some sense it is a big prayer because we're praying to a big God. And for me personally, when I want to get sort of a picture of the vastness and the greatness and the glory of God, I look at creation. 
when I want to see the beauty and the wonder of what God has made, the very, very small and the very, very large. But what really blows my mind is the very, very large. And, and when I went through school, I did, a, I did pretty well in school, but the sciences were the toughest thing for me. I didn't, like, gravitate towards the sciences. But when it comes to the kind of the, 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 the cosmos and the, and the greatness of the universe, it blows my mind and helps me see the greatness of God. And so I did a little bit of study getting ready for this message, just thinking about, okay, God, how big are you? How vast are you? How powerful are you? And so I did a little bit of work on this and did some research. So here's what I looked. First, I started looking kind of at our solar system. So the sun sits in the middle of our solar system, and everything kind of rotates around it. And, and the, the sun is the largest object in our solar system. Now, I'm going to share some things with you, and in your mind, you're going you're to do one of two things. You're going to either go, I knew that, or you're going to go, I did not know that. <laughs> I was not aware of that. But I'm going to share a few things. These are all things, I have to be honest, I was not aware of that, all right? Okay, so the sun is the largest object in our, in our solar system, which I, I probably didn't know that, but I could have probably guessed that. But I didn't realize how big it is, all right? Of all the mass in our solar system, of all the matter and all the mass, in your mind, answer this question. What percentage of the mass in our solar system does the sun take? I mean, what percentage of our solar system is the sun, you know, is, is the mass of the sun takes up what percentage of our solar system? in terms of all the mass. Here's the answer. 99.8%. So those of you who said, wow, you're, that's your way of saying, I did not know that. <laughs> all right? I did not know. Okay. So, okay, that's, that's incredible. So the sun, it, the diameter of the sun is roughly 109 times larger than the diameter of the earth. So you have the earth, which is relatively tiny compared, and 109 times the diameter. Which means, and I don't know, you know, this is mathematicians, not me figuring this out. So how, here's the next question. How many of our, of our Earth, of our planet, how many Earths, the mass of the Earth, would it take to fill the space that the sun consumes? How many Earths? 10, 100,000? Here's the answer. Over a million. That's how big the sun is. Now, here's why I, I do these things in my own mind. Because here's what I think. And God made it all and holds it in the palm of his hand. The sun that warms our earth was spoken into existence by God. That's how big he is. That's how powerful he is. That's how glorious he is. But then you, you go even bigger, all right? So then you, you say, okay, what, what is the largest star that has been discovered in the observable you know, space? It's called the Pistol Star, and it's believed to be about 100 times larger than our sun. So as big as our sun is, you can fit a million Earths into our sun, that star is a, is a hundred times larger than our sun. And then, you say, okay, so, so these are stars that are in galaxies. How many galaxies are there? In your mind, if you're a, if you're, if you're a scientist, scientist first, how many galaxies are there? Observable galaxies. Now, I have to be honest, I haven't counted these personally. Okay, but here's, here's, in 1999, with the equipment that scientists had, they were able to identify, in your mind, how many galaxies? Just 10, 100, 1,000, how many? Okay, scientists said in 1999, they estimated about 125 billion galaxies. I did not know that. But by 2013, with new tools and being able to see further out in the observable, in the observable space, they say it's more like 225 billion galaxies. And God holds all of that in the palm of his hand. And he spoke, and everything came into existence. And that God cares about my prayers? Yeah. That God says when you put your faith in Jesus, he moves inside of you, and he's the one who made everything. So Lord, we just pause again for a moment and say, wow. <laughs> It's hard for us to comprehend the vastness of space and all that you've made. But you not only comprehend it, you spoke it into existence and you hold it in the palm of your hand and you sustain all things by your word of power. God, you are a big, big, glorious God. And you want to hear from us. Grow us in prayer. And let our prayers become big because God, you who we speak to are bigger than we comprehend. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, if you're a note taker, I'm going to just walk through these five verses and give you some lessons about big prayers that we learn from Jesus as he's praying. And these should shape and form how we pray. 
So here's the first insight. Big prayers can be lifted up with eyes wide open. You can pray with your eyes wide open. Look at verse 1 of John 17. And after Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and he prayed. He looked toward heaven and he prayed. His eyes were open. My wife Sherry wrote a book called Praying with Eyes Wide Open. And I've, I've learned so much of what I know about prayer from Sherry and from her parents. I didn't grow up in a home where I was taught about prayer. I was kind of taught that God didn't exist. I grew up in a home without faith. And so I've learned so much of that just through being part of a Christian family through Sherry's family. But Sherry is a person of a passionate prayer. And so she, as she was writing this book, Praying with Eyes Wide Open, um, she, a friend of ours came over and visited, and he actually is with Jesus now. And Nabil Qureshi is his name. He was a Muslim, a Muslim evangelist who met, G he wrote a book called Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus. And he actually, in his seeking out of Allah, he met Jesus and was transformed. And so at the time, he was doing his PhD in New Testament at Oxford, and he was in our area here, and he was a friend of Shoreline Church, and so he was over at our home, and he asked Sherry, well, what are you working on now? What are you writing these days? And she talked to him about this book, Praying with Eyes Wide Open. And Sherry said, she said, she said Nabil, did you know that there's nowhere in the Bible where it ever says, and they close their eyes, well, no, there's nowhere in the Bible that says you have to close your eyes when you pray. And when you pray, close your eyes. She said, it's not in the Bible. And then Sherry went on to say to him, as a matter of fact, there's nowhere in the Bible that even says, and they closed their eyes, and then they prayed. And then he said to her, I think you're wrong. And so he went and researched it. He was back at Oxford, but then he contacted Sherry and said, you're right. I can't find anywhere in the Bible. And I said, well, Nabil, welcome to my life, telling my wife she's right. Um, but uh, but uh, he said, you're right, and we had a great conversation about it. And so, so actually, during this three-week series, we've actually, if you're, if you're interested, we've got copies of Praying with Eyes Wide Open at, a, like at, at the retail, at the, at the cost, like sale cost, here if you want to, and if you're online, you can call the church and we'll figure out how to get one to you. But it's a, if you want to grow in prayer, that's kind of like what I learned over, over you know, almost 40 years of knowing Sherry, all in kind of one place of teaching on prayer. But, but here, here Jesus is, and he, he looks to heaven and he prays. Uh, many times when you study Jesus' prayers, often it says, and Jesus looked to heaven and he prayed. And all through the Bible, you have people whose eyes are actually open when they pray. Why does that matter? Well, I think it matters because if we're going to pray a lot, we've got to learn to pray with our eyes open. Now, there are moments where we can close our eyes and fold our hands and pray and be very focused, and that's great. There's nothing wrong with closing your eyes when you pray. But there's also nothing wrong with having your eyes open. As a matter of fact, this last week, uh, Sherry was uh, invited to do a program on TCD, which I think is totally Christian television or something like that, but they asked her to do a, do a program with her and I together, but really on her book, on prayer, and it was amazing as we did this interview and talked with these, these three people that were doing the, the program, how, uh, Sherry was talking about different aspects of prayer. They were, they were just like, and they're leading, a, they're leading a show on prayer, but some of the things she was sharing were just like kind of opening their eyes, and then eyes wide open was one of those things that for some people it's like, man, that just, man, I, I, am I allowed to do that? When I was a little kid, if I opened my eyes during prayer, I got like my knuckles wrapped or something. Or I'd be like, close your eyes. We're praying, you know, talk to Jesus. But, uh, but, but here's the thing. We should be talking with God all the time. How do we do that if we only talk to God with our eyes closed? Not when you're driving down the road, you know. If you're going to start, if you, if you start praying for every church you drive by, Lord, lead that church, bless that church. You better keep your eyes open when you're on your bike or on, on your skateboard or in your car, right? Keep your eyes open. So, so Jesus prayed with his eyes open. So here's a question. How can you pray with your eyes open to God's presence, glory, and creation? How do you learn to pray with your eyes open to all that God is doing? And I think it's just recognizing that you can talk to God anywhere, anytime. It's just going to be like conversation. Years ago, I had kind of had this goal. I'm a Christian man. I, I want to be, I want to give, you know, leadership spiritually in my home. I love my wife. So I said, I'm going to try to like pray with Sherry a couple times a week. Like a couple times a week, I'll find a time and we'll sit down and I'll say, let's pray together. Like have an official prayer time. That was my goal. I don't have that goal anymore. I don't. Because we probably pray together four, five, six, seven times every day. But we almost never sit down and say, let's pray. We'll just be talking about something. We'll be talking about one of our kids one of our grandkids, or Shoreline Church, one of you, will come up in our conversation. And then one of us will just start praying. We say, yeah, yeah, that's going on with that person. All of a sudden, I'll realize, oh, wait, Sherry's not talking to me anymore. She's talking to Jesus. She's praying. And I'll just, and I don't close my eyes. I just join in. And I might, when she's done, I might pray a little prayer along with her. I'm doing it in my heart. And then we just go on with the next thing. And sometimes we don't even say amen at the end. Why? Because we're not done. 
Something's going to come up later on that we're going to pray about, and it's just become part of our lives. And now, with some of my friends, I've done that with some of my friends to where they'll be sharing something, and I'll just kind of go into prayer. And at first, I think it was kind of awkward. Now, some of my friends, I'll be sharing something, and then they just go into prayer, and I'm like, hey, that's my deal. I'm the one that goes into prayer here without telling anybody. You know, you're doing it. No, I don't think that, but it's like, it's like you know, what, what I've learned from Sherry, I then share with others. Other, and you can just talk to God anytime with your eyes wide open. I want to encourage you to look as you go through the flow of your day. And if you're with other Christians and somebody shares something, just roll into prayer. And then just let that become more and more of how you do life. So big prayers can be lifted with eyes wide open. Next, big prayers are lifted to our Father. Still in verse 1 of the passage. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that your Son may glorify you. Father. Jesus called God Father, but he taught his disciples, when you pray, pray our Father in heaven. There's something powerful and intimate about that language. Now, I know that not everyone had a great and wonderful and perfect dad. So if you say, well, when I say father, I think of my earthly father. What you have to think of is when I say father, I think when I say father to God, I think of the father I always wanted. If you had a great dad, then even better than your dad. But if, but, and I, I was preaching one time. I, I used to do a ministry. I trained people to do preaching in the jails in Grand Rapids. When we lived there for years, we would take teams into jails and, and preach and do services for people in the jails. And I was, one of the things they said to us is they said, don't refer to God as father when you're dealing with prisoners, because many of them had really, really difficult home lives. Their fathers were absent, and so if you say father, it's going to plant bad ideas in their minds, and they're going to think of God in a negative way. So I always honored and respected that advice until the Sunday I was preaching on Father's Day in the jail. And as I was preparing, God just put on my heart, these men need to know that they have a father who loves them. One of their deepest needs is to know that even though their dad may not have been there, their heavenly father will never leave them. So I had to decide, was I going to follow God's prompting in my heart or the head of the jail ministry? And at that one Sunday, I broke the rules. And I brought a message. The whole message was just about how you have a father that you may have never met, but he loves you more than you could imagine or dream. We never had a service in those jails, and we did a lot of this over the years, where more men stayed for prayer, where more men talked, and where more men were touched. They needed to know it. So even if you didn't have the perfect earthly father, and I actually shared in that, in that jail service, I said, I need to let you know something about my dad. So I love my dad, but my dad's an alcoholic. And he did some things through the years that weren't great things. But my heavenly father doesn't overdrink. <laughs> my heavenly father is always there for me. I let them know that my dad's not perfect either. So when you pray, if you're going to pray like Jesus, pray to your father. How can you increase your awareness that this great and mighty God invites you to approach him as your heavenly father? How do you, how do you grow just to say, I need to get used to saying, God, you are my father. You are, all, you, you, you are my uh, protector, my provider. You're, you're, if, even if my earthly father wasn't the perfect person, God, you are my perfect heavenly father. And seek his face that way. And, and then what you can also know is this. He's approachable. He's approachable. As your father... You know, there's people that, that, that might say, you know, we have a lot of people in our church that are part of the military. And you may have somebody who's an officer where people come and they salute and they have to respond a certain way and they don't feel they're approachable. But when they're in their home, for most of them, that's just daddy or that's just mommy. You know, they may be an officer in the military. But we, we just prayed for a family heading out who's going to the Pentagon right now. And the wife of the couple is, has a very high military position. But I watched her three kids with her today. She's just their mommy. <laughs> She, they, they love her as their mom. Why? Because that's their mom. And that's how we approach God. This big, glorious, powerful creator God says, come on in. I'm your heavenly father. That's beautiful. That's powerful. Big prayers are about the glory of God. We're still in verse 1, all right? Big prayers are about the glory of God. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son. Why? That your son may glorify you. Jesus says, Look, Father, my desire is to give you glory, to lift you up, to bring you praise and honor and glory. That should be our desire in prayer. God, all glory to your name. Some of your prayers through the flow of a day should be this. You notice something, see something, think of something and say, God, all glory to you, all praise to you, all honor to you. He deserves our praise. So here's the question. How can you pray more faithfully and intensely for the glory of God? How do you pray? 
with greater faithfulness, greater intensity, that God would be glorified. We began to pray, God, may your name be glorified. We've been studying the names of God at our nights of worship this year. You know, may your name be glorified. God, y- your power is glorious. I celebrate you. God, be glorified in this broken world. Would you pray, God, may you be glorified in a world that rebels against you, that fights against you. May you be glorified even in our world. Would you pray this prayer? Lord, in my life, be glorified. And how I think and talk and act and all that I do, be glorified. When I was a brand new Christian, uh, the, the, the 1970s, these simple kind of Maranatha praise songs were, were what churches were singing. There was this one song, the words were really simple. In my life, Lord, be glorified, be glorified. In my life, Lord, be glorified today. That's the whole song. Then they'd be like, in my prayers, Lord. And you put a different word, but it's always, in my life, Lord, be glorified, be glorified. We sung it hundreds of times. In my life, Lord, be glorified today. Simple prayer. God, be glorified in my life. God, be glorified in our church. Say, God, would you be glorified in the life of Shoreline Church? If you're online for another church, pray for God to be glorified in the life of your church. When you drive by other churches in the community, Lord, be glorified at Cypress Church. We drive by Cypress Church every time we leave our home. It's just right at the end of the street there. The pastor of Cypress Church and his wife live right next door to us, and we love them. We pray for God to be glorified. And you pray for other churches? You bet we do. Every Bible-believing Christian church, we should pray for God to be glorified. In your home, be glorified, Lord. In my work, be glorified, Lord. In my free time. Be glorified, Lord. In what I view with my eyes, what I do with my hands, be glorified, Lord. To you be all the glory. And then in verses 2 and 3, Jesus goes on. Big prayers are gospel-centered and have eternal scope. Big prayers focus on the gospel of Jesus, the good news of Jesus, and have an eternal heartbeat within those prayers. So Jesus goes on and prays in verse 2. For you granted him, speak Jesus speaking of himself, you granted him authority over all people, that he, Jesus, might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. That people would know the Father and know the Son, put their faith in Jesus Christ. So how can you increase your prayer for revival and salvation of the lost? How do you increase your prayer? Say, God, save those who are lost. Save those wandering sheep that are so far from you. I would suggest that every one of us should be praying faithfully and regularly for at least one person, one or more, that doesn't yet know Jesus. They're still wandering like a lost sheep. I was doing some training on on some evangelism training for church leaders in a a town called Amstelveen. It's right next to Amsterdam in, in the Netherlands. This is probably 20, 25 years ago. And I was training this group of leaders, and while I'm talking about really learning to reach the lost and share the gospel with the lost and have a broken heart for those that are still wandering like sheep without a shepherd, one of the leaders raises their hand as I was teaching. And so I'm like, oh, I said, yeah, what's up? They said, I don't like that word. And they said, oh, what word? They said, that word you use, I don't like it. And I said, I, I, said, I don't know what you mean. Now, you might notice I say lots of words, and I say them quickly sometimes. And so um, I, I was like, I'm trying to think, what did I say? I said, what word don't you like? And they said, lost. They said, you said people are lost without Jesus. I don't like that. And I said, well, I don't like it either. But it's true. I said, in Luke 15, Jesus talks about a lost sheep and a lost coin and a lost son. And all of them represent the people we know and love that don't know Jesus yet. I said, I don't like the word lost but Jesus used it a lot. Jesus' life mission statement was this. He said, I have come to seek and save the lost. That's why Jesus came. So who's one person that you love and that Jesus loves who's still wandering like a sheep without a shepherd? And can you pray for them faithfully, regularly? A big prayer to a big God for a big work in their life. Big prayers. Look at verse 4. Big prayers embrace God's mission for each of us. Look at verse 4. I have brought you glory on earth, Jesus says to the Father, by finishing the work you gave me to do. Jesus says, I've finished the work, the assignment, the task you gave me to do. Do you understand that you have a mission that God has given you? Probably lots of different missions. Things that he calls you to do, calls you to be. And you say, God, help me fulfill your plan for my life. Help me follow the mission you have for me. So I can say, God, I have fulfilled what you've called me to do, the work you gave me to do. 
So here's the question. What is the work God has given you to do? What is the work he's placed before you? That he will one day say, well done, good and faithful servant. It might be that that mission might be pouring into and loving your children. That's a call from God. You say, but my kids are 57 and 59. Yeah, you're still their parent. You're still their dad or their mom. And you're going, I know it. <laughs> it, it doesn't, you know, our, our sons are all in their 30s. They're still our sons. And we have a calling to love them, to help them walk in their faith, to encourage them. And now God's given us grandchildren, and we have a calling, and that's, that's a calling, that's a mission. God, help me fulfill the work you've called me to do. God's put you in a workplace where you're not only to do work with excellence to show the, the glory of God, but we are also to pray for people, to love people, and to model a Christian life. God, help me fulfill the work you've called me to do. Some of you are students. Some of you are serving in the military. Some of you are in the business world, the financial world, the educational world. If God has called you there, that's the work he's called you to do. Do you say, God, help empower me. God, you are so big. You are so powerful. Give me the strength I need to, to fulfill my calling in this place so I can say, God, I did the work you called me to do. If you're married... Walking in a marriage relationship, Lord, help me fulfill the work you've called me to do. Because marriage sometimes is lots of fun, and sometimes it's just, there's a part that's work that you stay disciplined and diligent and serve and love even when it's tough. Lord, let me fulfill the work you've called me to do. That's the prayer of Jesus. Let's make that our prayer more and more and more. Big prayers are Christocentric. It's a great theological word, and you can probably figure out what it means. Christ-centered. Big prayers center and focus on Jesus. Look at verse 5. And now, Father, glorify me, Jesus says, in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Jesus says, glorify me in your presence. Big prayers focus on Jesus. Here's the question. What are ways you can lift up the name, the fame, and the glory of Jesus? How do we lift up his name? How do we lift up his fame? How do we lift up his glory? And one of the things when it comes to prayer that we often do is we go, well, you know, we pray in the name of Jesus. You know, the Bible says pray in the name of Jesus. Let me be clear about something. Praying in the name of Jesus doesn't mean this. It doesn't mean I lift up whatever prayer I want, and then I kind of slap on the end, in the name of Jesus. And now I get what I want, because I said it was in Jesus' name. That's not what it means to pray in the name of Jesus. I pray for this, that, that, whatever's on my mind, and then in the name of Jesus, and now God has to do what I tell him because I did it in the name of Jesus. No. Do you know what in the name of Jesus means? You pray as Jesus would want you to pray. You represent his heart as you pray. So when you say in the name of Jesus, you say, this is what Jesus would pray. This is why we're studying the longest prayer of Jesus. We want to know how Jesus prayed. If somebody came to me and they said, they said hey, I'm going to tell you something in the name of Sherry Harney, in the name of your wife. Oh, what, what, and then they're obviously they're passing something on from Sherry. I said, what, what are you going to share? Sherry wants you to know, Kevin, that you're way too gentle and that you need, you need to be harsher and tougher with people. And Sherry wants you to know that you just need to toughen up a little bit. I'd say, my wife didn't say that. <laughs> we've, been married, we've been known each other for almost 40 years. My wife would say things like, Kevin, you're working hard at it, but you've got to be a little more gentle. You've got to be a list, list. I mean, I, I know my wife. If someone said, Sherry said this, and there's nothing like Sherry said, I'd go, she didn't say that. Why? I know her. So watch this now. When we come before God and we lift up a prayer that's not in line with the heart of Jesus, and we tell the Father in the name of Jesus, he knows when it's not true because the Father and the Son are one. Let's not try to fool God. But when we pray, oh God, my son who's wandering far from you. I pray you'll draw him close to you and your power and your bigness. Show him your love. Surround him with people who draw him back to yourself. And I pray this in the name of Jesus. The father says, oh, that's the heart of my son. That's in the name of Jesus, right? Oh, God, man, my marriage right now is tough and I'm, I'm, at, I'm just, this last 14 months has drained me and I don't know, I don't have much more to give to my spouse, to give to my kids. Will you fill me, God? Will you give me power? Will you help me stay, will you help me watch my mouth so I'm, I'm wise with what I say? I pray that you'll help me to really love and serve my family even though I'm empty, pour through me and I pray this prayer in the name of Jesus. The father goes, oh, that's the heart of my son. That's the heart of Jesus. We pray for the glory of Jesus. We pray in the name of Jesus. And that means our prayers sound like the prayers of Jesus. 
They reflect the heart of Jesus. And then we say, in the name of Jesus. Oh, Jesus, we come before you right now. Eyes closed, eyes open, heads bowed, heads looking toward heaven. But we come to you and we say, God, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray for your glory, for the glory of Jesus. Teach us to pray for the gospel to spread throughout this world. Teach us to pray for your church, for our families. God, you are a big and glorious and powerful God. Make our prayers as big as your heart. And then answer them for your glory, for the sake of Jesus and for the sake of the world. We pray this in his name, and we pray this for the glory of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Before you head out, I want to give you a couple invitations, and then I want to send you off with a word of blessing. So my first invitation is this. If you, in the next three to four months, are moving on for whatever reason, would you honor us by just heading right through the lobby and right into the Pacific Room, and we're going to have teams of pastors there, and Sherry and I will be there, and we want to give you uh, one of those coins. We want to give you a book. We want to pray for you and send you off with God's blessing. And, so, and if you're online and you're transitioning and heading out of the area, will you call the church this week and just say, hey, Pastor Kevin talked about uh, transitioning. We're moving on. We will find a way to reach out to you and meet you right where you're at and bless you in this time of transition. If you want prayer, and talk about prayer today, boy, we've got a team of people who love to pray all, we have three, three folks ready to pray with you. If you have a burden or a joy, whatever it is, don't leave today without heading right over here letting those folks join you in prayer. If you're online and you need prayer, you can either email your prayers to the email address you see on the screen, or you can call the number that's there, and we have people actually waiting right now that will pray with you, and they'll pray for God's work and God's hand in your life. And if you are new at Shoreline, and you're on campus in the, in, in the, in the family worship venue or here in, the, in, here in the worship center, uh, and, and you uh, are new here, before you leave the campus, go through the lobby to the left right there to our Connection Center. And we have a team there that wants to, they want to give you a gift. Thank you for coming. Uh, answer any questions you have and just get to know you personally. If you're online, just text the word WELCOME to the number you see on the screen right now. And what will happen is we'll send you a di digital connection card and we'll reach out to you wherever you are and make sure we do the best we can to build a bridge uh, across the space here. But we're, we're glad that you're with us today. If you're able to stand at home, family worship venue, in the worship center, stand with me and let me send you off with a word of blessing. As we close this time, may you go in the, in the name of the big, glorious creator God who made the galaxies and everything in them and holds them in the palm of his hand. May you speak with him often, like breathing. Don't reserve prayer for special moments. Every moment's a chance to talk with God. May you speak your heart to him. May you pray in his name in ways that honor him. And may you see big results from your big God. God bless you. Have a great week. And we'll be back here for part two of this prayer and the sermon next Sunday. God bless you. Have a great day.